the Park Fire Department here to 19 general announcement. The Chief's Office would like to advise all members to assure their family's safety and readiness for the incoming hurricane. Department standby will begin at 1500 hours and will continue throughout the storm. End of announcement, 1100 hours, dispatch at 30. This announcement was the turning point of my young adult life. At this point, uh, I was a firefighter for about three years. It was three days after my 21st birthday, and I was on top of the world. Of course, just like anybody else, the first thing I was worried about was my own family. Uh, I told them about everything that they told us. I told them they're really expecting the storm to hit hard, and they didn't believe me. All the storms before this one had always been, oh, it's going to be really bad, it's going to be really bad, and then nothing ever happened. So they kind of just had that same idea about it. Regardless, the firefighter in me couldn't just sit idle about it. So I went to the supermarket, bought a couple of cases of water, and I filled up my uh, car's gas tank with gas. All the cars in the house filled with gas. And now I understand why that was so important. So when I got to the firehouse, um, they split us up into three crews. They had the first two crew, the second two crew, and the third two crew. And the third crew was pretty much relaxing until the first crew went on a call, and then the third crew become active. Um, we also did a lot of rig checks, did checks on all the rigs. Rigs stand for trucks, another word for trucks. Um, and we made sure that each fire truck had extra chainsaws, extra cribbing equipment, pulling equipment, just in case we needed it. We also changed one of the fire trucks, which is this one, uh, 142. It's a brush truck made for forest fires, and we altered it so that it can go into really high water, just in case we needed it. So the first call we went on was on Half Hall Road in Deer Park, in our town, from the Deer Park Fire Department. And uh, what we were met with at first, it came over as a wires down call. So we were just expecting wires arcing in the floor from the wind, and that was it. And we pulled up, and we saw wires in the middle of the, uh, the front lawn arcing into the ground actively and a burning building. So we made entry into the house, trying to avoid the wires in the front, and we got met with more challenges. The wind was pushing the fire back onto us and pushing the fire on the house next door. Regardless, we overcame these challenges, and we were back at the firehouse within the hour. When we got back to the firehouse, everybody at the firehouse that was left, the other crews, were watching the news, and a couple were listening to the radio. So I went over to the ones listening to the radio to try and find out what was going on. And we heard a lot of the South Shore towns of Long Island start getting called out for evacuation requests. And these calls started to become so cumbersome that they ended up calling us for help. So I was on the crew that, one of the crews that initially went down to start evacuating people. When we got to these houses, uh, it varied between three feet of water to five feet of water in certain areas. We in initially went to Linnehurst which is in Suffolk County, and then we went to Copeg, and we went back to Linnehurst. Um, it's funny, one of my friends, Dan Horn, he's actually a student with me at NYT when I was in school, he lives in Linnehurst, and he was kind of expecting the same thing. Nothing really was going to happen, et cetera. And now I'm in his town, and the houses are like underwater pretty much. So I was kind of worried about that. Um, we ended up carrying kids and animals on our shoulders, pushing through the four feet deep water, which is about this high, uh, with the current and waves crashing into us. So I got really good at pretty much the game chicken when you put your friends on your shoulders and you play in the pool. Um, we were taking really tremendous risks with these brush trucks, putting them in the water like this, because it's not what they're made for. So we were really worried about what was going to happen, but regardless, we went in and we did it, and we, uh, we put a lot of people out. But when we got to some houses, you wouldn't believe the responses we got. But before I get there, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. It's 11 p.m., you live on the South Shore of Linnehurst, and you're in the middle of a hurricane. All you hear is your friends and your neighbors, how their houses are filled with water, and there's water in your house, and you hear waves crashing on your basement uh, walls, and you start to get worried about your own family. So you realize, all right, I got a family here, let me call 911, because I don't know if they're, they're going to be able to get to me, because there's a lot of water outside. So you call 911. And a half hour later, because of the volume of calls, you hear knock, 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 fire department. 
So you're excited. You're like, thank God they're here. You open the door, and you met with two firemen. Now, you're told you have two choices. Either you leave with them right now with nothing but the clothes on your back and the clothes on your family's backs and leave everything you've lived and worked for behind. Or you stay where you are, and you have no idea if anybody else can get to you for the rest of the storm. What would you have done? These are the decisions that people have to make on a daily basis, on an hourly basis during the storm. The responsibility of firefighters is already very high, but this night it was very tremendous. Everything, every time that we went north from the South Shore to try and empty out all the people from our trucks, when we got back, it was even worse. W water was a lot higher because of the current and the tides. Trees were coming down, going into the water, and then you wouldn't see them. So we'd be driving in the truck, driving in the brush truck. All of a sudden, we hit a huge bump in the middle of the road, and we're like, what's going on? So either we get over it, or if we can't get over it, we have to find another way to these people. One call we went to, which uh, stuck out in my mind a lot, was there was a family with uh, the, fa the grandmother of the family had a breathing problem and they called for an oxygen tank replacement. So normally, whenever you have a, family with a, a patient with an oxygen tank replacement, you have to transport them to the hospital. You don't have a choice because of protocols in the area. So when we got to this house, uh, the house was about four feet of water in the front lawn, open the door, five feet of water in the living room, and the entire basement was filled with water. We're yelling, where are you? Hello, is anybody here? We get up the stairs into the second floor, go into the bedroom, and you have a very scared family. It was a, a mother, a father, an 11-year-old kid, and a grandmother. Everybody's worried about the grandmother. She's having trouble breathing. Her oxygen is very, very low. So we switch out her oxygen bottle, and we tell them, listen, you don't have a choice. You have to leave. Everybody here has to leave. So that was a very difficult decision for all these people. However, the 11-year-old kid was actually very excited to go. He was so worried, he actually ran up to us, jumped into my arms, and said in his little 11-year-old voice, I'm ready. <laughs> so it took us 20 minutes to get the rest of the family to kind of go. And uh, they wanted to bring their dog and all their bags and everything, but unfortunately, we could only carry their dog. So we brought their dog with them, so they were a little bit more comfortable at the shelter. Um, it was actually a really good thing that we took this family out of the house, because three hours later, we had a fire on that block. So we went back to that block, and uh, the water was four feet deep, and we couldn't get the engine down the block. Somehow, one of Lindenhurst's fire engines got all the way down the block. We got our brush truck that you saw before down the block, and together we fought the fire, both, both trucks. And uh, we started out with just the deck guns on the top of the fire truck, because we didn't know if the electricity was live yet, so it was live still. So if the power was live, we didn't want to go in the water and die. So uh, we ended up fighting the fire from on top of the fire truck. And then when we found out and we got confirmation that the, all the power was dead, um, the firefighters jumped off. I jumped off. My lieutenant jumped off. And we were in water this high, carrying two and a half inch hose and trying to get into this house to fight the fire. Um, eventually, the water ran out. And obviously, we can't get to the fire hydrants because the water is this high and the hydrant is only this high. So, we uh, actually, not me, but the lieutenant from my fire truck came up with that idea. Let's draft water from underneath the fire truck and fight the fire. So the fire engine drafted water from the right underneath the truck, loaded it into the truck, from the truck into our brush truck, and into the hoses, and we fought the fire and eventually overcame those challenges. The neighbors, when we knocked on their door, were more than ready to go. They said, take me out of here. I don't want to see my house anymore. Um, and the amount of gratitude and respect that they showed us was unimaginable. It really showed me that I was no longer a kid that wanted to help. I was a man helping. So after the storm, uh, we really continued helping people and we really wanted to, we knew there was a lot of people displaced, a lot of people really messed up, out of their homes, don't know what to do. So we went out in the towns that were affected, Lindenhurst, Copex, South Shore, ended up going into the Rockaways and uh, Breezy Point, which was, had a really big fire. Uh, and we pretty much asked them, what do you guys need? What can we help you with? How can we help you? 
And we found out that all they really needed was some warm, dry clothes, because all their clothes was <coughs> ruined. Uh, so every member of the fire department posted a Facebook status that said, there's a clothing drive at the Deer Park Fire Department. You have to bring clothes by the end of the day, separate it into kids, adults, men, women clothes. And uh, we actually had so much clothes that we filled up the rescue truck, a 25-yard dump truck, the bed of a the department pickup truck, and three fire trucks filled with bags of clothes. So we go down to Linnehurst, we drop clothes off, too much clothes. We still have so much clothes to get rid of. We go to Copeg, too much clothes. South Shore, too much clothes. Everybody's getting on the phone, all their friends in the South Shore departments. Listen, we have all this clothes, we don't know where to bring it, we need to bring it somewhere. Everybody said Breezy Point. So we go out to Breezy Point in the Rockaways, and uh, they had this, all the, pretty much like five or six churches in the area had a uh, clothing drive, flu, food drive, clothing drive, food drive. So we found one, uh, St. Francis de Sales Church in the Rockaways, and we walk in, and this is the site we see. That is, none of this is clothes. This is all food, canned food, canned drinks, um, non-perishable goods, but they didn't have any clothes. So they had a free stop and shop, but no clothes. So we brought them all the clothes that we had. We called up the other departments down on the South Shore that didn't know where to put it. We told them, bring it on to, um, to the Rockways. And we gave them this address. Every single person that we met at this place was so thankful for every single thing that we did. It was totally an amazing experience. Um, Everything from the, clo from the article of clothing to the roll of toilet paper, literally, they grabbed their hands and they thanked us so much. Um, I, I once actually heard a quote. Uh, it said, monumental differences can be made by minuscule actions. This was very evident that day. Al also, another quote that I heard was, uh, risk and responsibility are not polar opposites. They're two sides of the same coin. Um, if there's a couple things I could ask of all of you, it would be to listen to somebody when they tell you to evacuate, listen to firefighters when they tell you to evacuate, and don't overuse 911. If you have an emergency, call 911 by all means, but if you don't, don't call them. Um, when you call 911 and it's for no reason, you're risking your lives, but you're also risking our lives, because we're the ones that have to come out and get you. Um, so I want you to keep in mind the risks and responsibilities of the people on both sides of the front door that night, and that's it. Thank you.